Uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker. Uh, Coral Union is going to sing and uh, lead us in some uh, uh, more worship. But when he walks up, I want you to know this is Kevin Harney. Kevin is pastor of Shoreline Community Church in Monterey, California. He, uh, what can I say? Kevin is uh, a gifted communicator. And, and by that I mean he, he's, he's just really good at explaining what the Bible means, what the Christian gospel is all about. He is a, a visionary leader. I've known him for now for over 22 years, and I'm just amazed at what he is able to get done and how people trust him, because he is trustworthy. Uh, he's a lot of fun. He's a good friend. But I wouldn't just throw anybody up here just because I like them. Uh, I want you to know Kevin Harney is worth listening to. And he's, this is, I think, your sixth year here at Westmont coming to be with us. So, Kevin, we, we welcome you in the name of Christ and your wonderful wife, Sherry. And uh, so that's who's coming up. Not Sherry, but Kevin. Uh, he's the one with the less hair. And uh, he'll be up here in just a moment. But uh, Coral Union. Yeah. Thank you. I get an opportunity to speak in a lot of places. I'm a local church pastor, but a few weeks ago I was preaching in Australia, and a few weeks I'll be preaching in New Zealand. I've been in chapels that are gorgeous, that don't look like a gym, uh, that have stained glass windows that are hundreds of years old, and that's wonderful. But at the end of the day, the thing that matters when you gather like this is that God's people are together in the presence of the living God and that his spirit meets you. And just sitting here and worshiping, uh, the spirit of God is here. God is present here. Uh, you get past the building really quickly when you meet the maker of all things. And I want to encourage you, uh, especially those of you that are juniors and seniors here, uh, that you understand that the sweetness of God's presence that's here, that either you are experiencing and tasting and feeling and drinking in, or some of you are missing completely because <laughs> you're just uh, thinking about the next class or the next thing. I want to challenge you that the time you have left here at Westmont, notice God's presence because you may not get anything quite this sweet for a long time. Maybe a long, long time. But this is good, and God is present. And this is a chapel with the presence of God. And so it's an honor to be here, and uh, I just, as I was worshiping and sensing God's presence, just wanted to say what a, what a uh, blessing it is every time I get to be here. Well, I, I wanna do a quick quiz. <clears throat> I know you didn't plan on a quiz in chapel, but here's what I'm suggesting. I have four questions. If you get all four of them right, if you get 100%, I'm suggesting you go to any of your teachers, professors, and tell them you got 100% on the quiz in chapel. Can you trade it for some other test or quiz you had? I'm not saying they're gonna say yes, but it doesn't hurt to try. Okay, so here, here, it's a little different quiz, maybe, than you're used to. It's a who is this quiz. All right, so here we go. First, who is this? Okay, if you're right, take up one hand, put up one finger, and say, okay, I got one for one, okay? Number two, who is this? You told me they were smart, but this is staggering, okay? Now we're gonna go into the political arena internationally. Okay, who is this? Okay, thank you, good, okay, Jasmine, very good. Now we're gonna go multicultural. You ready? Here you go. Who is this? Okay. Okay, so if you got all four, give it a shot. Talk to a professor until I got 100% in the quiz at chapel. And, and maybe, you don't know, maybe, maybe. Uh, Disney has, has told a lot of stories. And the Disney Corporation has, has presented a message again and again and again and again through the years. It's become very familiar. Uh, for some people, they, they've, they've gotten very really involved in this. For some of you, your favorite place in the world is Disneyland. Some of you know all the princesses and maybe all the Prince Charmings. Uh, but, but at the end of many of these stories, at the end of the storyline of many Disney kind of epic stories, there's sort of an ending that's become not always but quite common. I'm going to give you that ending. This would be extra credit, okay? If you can give me the last two words, you get the extra credit, okay? And they all lived happily... There you go. I mean, they all live happily ever after. And that's a wonderful idea. It's a wonderful concept. The dilemma is, for most of us in our lives, if you've watched lots of Disney, if you've got that concept, if you're, if you're thinking, I'm looking forward to a life where I just live in a constant 
perpetual, happily ever after, you might have found yourself discouraged at times. Because, you know, when the credits roll and the, and the perky little tune comes at the end, and, and it always ends up kind of happily ever after, in real life, the credits don't always roll and the tune's not always perky and it's not always happily ever after. So I'm going to give you a new line, a new closing storyline that I want you that every time you see that message of happily ever after, you would replace it with this new saying. And here it is. And they all lived happily ever after, after. So we try that together? And they all lived happily ever after, after. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you live your life in the presence of this one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who loves you, who's given his life for you, who woos you and seeks you by his Holy Spirit, you understand that the truth of the matter is it's not always happily ever after, but it is always happily ever after after. Well, what do you mean by happily ever after after? Well, sometimes what that means is your happily ever after after is that you have great joy and, and, and wonderful moments in this life, but oftentimes after a challenging time, after a difficult time, after a painful time. And sometimes what it means is you live happily ever after, after. For some people, they live this life and they pursue God and they walk in faithfulness and this life is just hard. And there's moments of pain and loss and sorrow and grief that are so deep you can't even put them into words. And for those people, they have to remember that God's promise is not happily ever after, it's happily ever after, after. And sometimes we get tastes of that and experiences of that right now in this life, after a hard times that God just kind of, kind of just moves them by his spirit and touches with his grace and brings his peace and, and this hope you long for that seemed to evade you, now it's there. But sometimes it's happily ever after, after in a longer sense. And, and someone might say, well, you know, this isn't a message for college students because, I mean, college students, they haven't had hard things happen yet. I mean, for them, their lives are easy and smooth and everything's going their way. The problem is, I know that's not true. I know sitting in this room right now, sitting in this, this chapel, this place where God's spirit just saturates us with his presence, th there are people who have already, I mean, just felt the deep sting of betrayal. There's people sitting here who you, you have been a friend to someone, you've walked with them, you've been faithful in that friendship, you've, you've cared for them deeply, and they just dumped you. They bailed on you. They, in your toughest moment, you said, man, I've been a friend for you, and all of a sudden they're like, Poof, gone. Some of you know that pain, and you're wondering, you know, I'm a, I'm a follower of Jesus. Where's my happily ever after? Where is it? Some of you have known the fracturing, deep soul pain of watching two people in your life, maybe the two most important people in your life, who stood before God and others and said, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and health, as long as we both shall live. And they made this covenant, this vow, and somehow along the way, whatever it was, whatever happened, it just kind of blew apart. And some of you are just living in the collateral damage of that. And some of you can name it and point it out and be specific. And some of you are like, I don't know exactly what it is, but I just know man, something went wrong. And you're saying, where's my happily ever after? Some of you have a hope and a longing and a dream that, that, maybe, that maybe just God's birth in your heart or that you just have deep in your soul and you're like looking for it and you're longing for it and you're dreaming of it. And it just seems to just kind of keep going away. It's just not there. I think of my wife, Sherry. Uh, we were just talking about this in Ben's office before he came over here. Uh, that in her freshman year of college, going to a great college in the Midwest, great Christian college, would have loved to have met a neat guy, Prince Charming. <laughs> it's a wonderful guy. Didn't happen our freshman year. But their sophomore year. Gonna meet that guy, maybe, maybe, all year long. No, I didn't meet that guy. He didn't have a date. <laughs> junior year. Junior, that's a good year to meet a guy. Junior year's nice. Juniors, juniors, yeah, okay, okay, I'll take it, you know. And <laughs> didn't happen. Senior year. Okay, it's senior year. And, and she loved Jesus. She was being faithful to him. She was seeking him with all of her heart. And not only did no guy come along, 
But in her room area, there were four other young women, and they were all either engaged, dating seriously, and a few of them were planning weddings. So when they come in the, in the room all excited and happy, and she's hasn't, you know, where's my happily ever after? And she said there was times where she would, she would always be happy for them, always rejoice for them. She said there was times where she'd lay in her bed and turn towards the wall and the tears would just flow down. Because she's saying, I love Jesus too. You know, I, I'm seeking to be faithful. But she prayed. She prayed. Her RA actually said, Sherry, every time you feel that longing, just pray for whoever that guy is. So she prayed for her Prince Charming. <laughs> she never met him, but she got me. And, uh, but you keep, kissing the, you keep kissing the frog, and maybe eventually. So keep kissing, baby, keep kissing. <laughs> but uh, I tell you, kiss harder, man. It's, it's getting, we're getting, we're trying, we're trying. Okay, that's a, that's a whole other chapel talk. We're going to stop right there. We're going to stop right there. Here's the challenge. Here's the challenge for us. Um, when it comes to how we look at this life and, and, and the, the, the story of the happily ever after, I, I think it causes us to, to expect so much of this life. I, I think we expect too much of this life and not enough of the next life. I think as Christians, we expect way too much of this life. And I don't think we think about and hope for and long for enough that which lies ahead the glory that's to be revealed that outweighs all the struggle and the pain. I want to tell you two stories. A story about a man, a story about a woman. A story from the New Testament, a story from the Old Testament. And these are both people who, who sought after God, who loved God, and they didn't get their happily ever after. But they did get a happily ever after after. And I want you to hear these stories because these, these are not people who uh, did all the wrong things, but they were seeking to do all the right things, and yet it just seemed like that carrot on the stick of what they would have longed for or dreamed for just kind of stayed out there ahead of them. The first person I want you to meet, the first story I want to tell is a story of faithfulness and excruciating pain. And I want you to meet the Apostle Paul. I want you to meet the Apostle Paul maybe in a way that you haven't quite met him before. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul is talking about his life, his journey of faith. He had lived a life you know, far from God, persecuting Christians, causing all kinds of trouble. But when he met Jesus, man, when he, got, when he saw the light, when he hit the ground, when he was changed, when his eyes were opened, he was a different person. And he sought God with passion. He loved God deeply. But it didn't mean that he got happily ever after. It didn't mean now, now that I'm seeking God doing the right things, it's going to be easy. It didn't mean that. And so, so later on in life, the Apostle Paul is looking back and he's writing to the church at Corinth and he's saying, here's some of my experience in following Jesus. This is some of, what I, some of what I walked through. He says, I've worked much harder. I've been in prison more frequently. I mean, again and again, he's thrown in prison just for following Jesus. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Here's the one I want you to notice in verse 24 of 2 Corinthians 11. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Five times. The 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. And it goes on and on to the emotional and spiritual turmoil and weight of loving and caring for the churches. And here's the Apostle Paul. If you were to write the script... You know, so that when the credits roll and the music plays, you wouldn't have written it like this because Paul experienced pain after pain after pain. And I had this moment, I don't know, it was some years ago, I was thinking about, the, you, know, you know how you, sometimes you read the Bible, whether it's for a class or for your own kind of spiritual growth or with your family, sometimes you read the Bible and the pastor just kind of goes by and you're, oh yeah, whatever, I get it. And, you're, and then one day you read it and the Holy Spirit just sort of opens your eyes and you go, oh my goodness, I never saw, I never knew that, I never saw that. This, this reality that five times the Apostle Paul received the 40 lashes less one, it hit me one day. I did the math. 195 scars. 195 scars on his body. 
What they would do with the 40 lashes minus one. And the, the idea was kind of that if they, if they hit 40 or beyond, there were some things in the Jewish law that, that kind of forbid that. But there was also the sense that if you went beyond that, you could kill someone. And the idea was to kind of torment them and torture them, but not actually kill them. And so this is done to Paul five times. And I'm trying to think about this as someone who's being faithful, who's following Jesus, who's doing the ministry that God's called them to do, who's pursuing it with passion, who's not getting their, hap- not only not their happily ever after, but man, a lot of pain. And what they would do is they, they, would, they would strap someone up and they would rip off the, the, the clothing on the upper part of their body so that their, 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 their chest and their stomach and their sides and their shoulders and their back and their, their buttocks and their neck were all exposed. And again and again and again, they would just beat this person within the inch of their life. So this is done to the Apostle Paul for being faithful, for following Jesus. And he has 39 scars, not scars. You know, I got a scar on my finger here. If you look really close, you can see it. Not that kind of scar. Scars. 39 of them on his body. Do you quit? Do you give up? Do you say, okay, I'm not getting my happily ever after. I'm not following Jesus. He didn't. He kept preaching. He kept speaking the truth. He kept following Jesus passionately. And they strapped him up again. And they beat him again. And and, and so then he has 78 scars on his body. And later they do it again. And he has 117 scars on his body. And they do it again. And he has 156 scars on his chest, on his stomach, on his sides, on his back, on his arms. And I've, and I've tried to imagine, I think one of the things the Bible does is it gives us a picture so we can actually see what we weren't there to see, but we can imagine what happened. I've tried to imagine the fifth time, because the fifth time they strap him up, Paul knows what's coming. He knows what it feels like when his flesh is being abused. He's been there over and over and over. They strap him up for the fifth time. And I imagine the person who was responsible for the beating. These are not soft-hearted people. If your job is to beat people with an inch of their life, you're like, you're a tough person. But I imagine that person ripping off Paul's robe and looking at the tapestry of mutilated flesh. This this guy's job was to bring the whip down and create scars. And there's nothing but scars. I mean, there's scars on scars on scars. And so the whip comes down again, the fifth time through this. And when it's all said and done, when the Apostle Paul regains consciousness and regains his his sanity, which you lose when someone's beating you like that, you've got to just for a moment just lose your mind. If you've been in pain before, severe pain, you don't even think right. But when his mind came back to him and when his body could move again, he says, where do we go next to preach Jesus? What's the next town? What's the next place? Knowing what could await him there. Happily ever after? Really? Happily ever after, after. This is why in Philippians 1, the Apostle Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'll stay, keep, I'll continue living for your sake, to serve, to love. But man, if it's up to me, I'd be with Jesus. But what Paul knew is what we know. It's not up to us. God gives us one life to live for him. And the happily ever after doesn't always come the way we might want it to. Now turn back to ancient Israel. Turn back to another time in history. The story of a woman who was faithful. A story of faithfulness and deep sorrow and loss. I want you to meet Hannah. Hannah, the mother of Samuel. Hannah, who you might have met before, but I don't know if you've really fully understood her story. This was another story in the scriptures that I'd heard many times, I'd read many times, but it didn't connect. And, and actually, I started thinking about the happily ever after idea with Hannah. Because Hannah was married, and what she wanted was in that culture that time, she wanted what every woman wanted at that culture at that time. She wanted a child. And one word kind of marked Hannah's life. Barren. A word in the ancient world that was sort of like the kiss of death. It was like the worst thing, barren. We don't know exactly how long, but from the story in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and following, from what we can tell, it was probably 10 to 20 years. Now think about this, 10 to 20 years. Some of you aren't, aren't yet 20 years old, 
But for 10 to 20 years, she prayed and prayed, Lord, give me a child. Lord, give me a child. Lord, give me a child. Lord, where's my happily ever after? She watched people right around her who seemed to have the happily ever after. They'd hardly try. Pregnant again, hardly try. Pregnant again, but not her. And so for 10 to 20 years, year after year, she'd go to Shiloh, the place of worship, where the great prophet Eli was, the great prophet priest Eli was. And she'd pray, and she'd pray, and she'd pray. And it felt like those prayers were always landing on the deaf ears of God and deaf ears of heaven. And so one time when she goes to Shiloh with her husband, and she's praying, she's, she's so, she's so broken. And she's so, her heart is, is just so devastated that she's praying, it seems like a drunk woman. She's just, she's just, just blurting out her heart and she's just crying out to God and she's just, she doesn't even know, you know, the words she said, say that sem, said that same prayer so many times, she's just, just pouring out her heart to God. So the, Eli, the priest, sees her, he thinks she's drunk because she's just so deep in prayer and so broken and so hurting. And so, so he accuses her. He says, how long are you you're gonna stay drunk? Put away your wine. This is what the priest says to her. I mean, she's broken already and the priest is accusing her of being drunk at church. And here's her response. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman, in, I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I've been pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here, listen to this, out of my great anguish and out of my great grief. She says, I'm not drunk. I'm broken. I'm I'm just at, at the bottom. She cries out to God. God, where's my happily ever after? Where's my child? She finally in her prayer, she says, God, God, if you'll give me, and be careful what you promise God in prayer. (laughs) She says, God, if you give me a child, I'll give that child back to you. That child will become a Nazarite. That child, I'll take the vow on behalf of that child, and I will give that child to the service of God. I'll give that child to your service. I'll bring that child to Shiloh. I'll put that child in the care of Eli. That child will grow up to serve God. That was her prayer. Eli also prays for her, and he says, by next year, you'll have a child. And by the next year, she does. She names him Samuel. Samuel who becomes kind of, the, kind of the last of the great judges and kind of the first of the prophet priests of Israel. Kind of, he, just, he has this unique role in this hinge time in the history of God's people. Her son, her baby, her little boy Samuel. And so we, we tend to read the story in 1 Samuel chapter one and we tend to look at, okay, there it is, happily ever after. I mean, it was hard. I guess it's kind of happily ever after after because because it's been a long, hard road, but now she gets a child. Here's the dilemma that she faces. She's promised God she's gonna give this child to Eli to serve. And so another year goes by. And when the time is right, she brings her son Samuel. And she brings him to Shiloh. And she brings him to Eli. And she says, Eli, you raise him. He belongs to the Lord. And she goes home. In those days, there was not Skype, there was not Zoom, there was not Instagram, there was not uh, phones, there was not photography. She came back once a year with her husband to worship. Try to imagine this. Young men, young women who, who someday may have a child. She watched her firstborn child grow up in a once a year snapshot. I mean, just she'd come, she'd get to see him, all year long, she, as any mother would, she would wonder, how much has he grown? What does he look like? You know, has he, has, has he, has he started, you know, has he started running? Is he good at this? Is he good at that? And just, just all these questions. Eventually, is he starting to get peach fuzz? Is he starting to, has his voice changed? You know, she's just, she's, she's not there. She comes, she comes to Shiloh. She sees him. And every year, she tries to imagine, I, I can see her almost looking at the other boys in her village, watching them grow up day by day. And saying, how big is Samuel now? Because every year she'd make a, another, another you know, cloak from another little outfit, one outfit, and she'd bring it each year, hoping it was the right size to fit him. She'd look in his face. She'd adore her child. She would pack up and she'd go home until the next year. It wasn't a happily ever after. It was still a, a, an act of sacrifice and service. 
but her happily ever after came. It just came after. Happily ever after after. In your life and in my life, I, I think we've been told culturally, and I think for some of you, if you could name all the princesses of Disney, not just those four, but all of them, and whoever their Prince Charming was, uh, you might have heard the story. <laughs> you might be believing that the way life works is if you're faithful to God, if you follow Jesus, it will just go your way and things will be easy and good. The problem is for most of you, you've already figured out it's not working out that way. So then you start to say, okay, God, did you lie to us? But the reality is God didn't lie to us. But the storytellers of our culture have made us believe a story that isn't the biblical story. God brings joy and God brings peace, and God brings victory. But sometimes the happily ever after comes after. And as you walk through this life, and, and I'm, not, I'm not a real old guy yet, but I know some old people. Um, <laughs> hey, you went there with the hair? I'm going there with the age, buddy. Uh, <laughs> did anybody notice that? That that was totally unnecessary, the shot about the hair? Did that seem totally un Anyways. Uh, <laughs> and so this dear friend of mine, years ago, said this, he said, I'm not at the end of the road, but I can see it from here. <laughs> and that's the guy who said it. That guy said that at a couple's retreat at a church I served over a decade ago. So Ben, you, do you remember that? Ben, you stood there in front of us over a decade ago and you said, I'm not at the end of the road, but I can see it from here. How's the view now? Is it pretty, can you see it? I mean, do you ever say that still? He still says that. I'm not at the end of the road, but, but I realize, I'm starting to realize in my 50s now, this isn't all there is. One of the people who's, one of the couples that have taught us the fullness of this, you know, as you move on in life has actually been Ben and Loretta Patterson, who are dear friends that every time we get to be with them, God just speaks to our hearts and speaks to our lives. We over-esteem this life and under-esteem what lies ahead. But we should absolutely live fully in this life. I'm not talking about, about discouragement. I'm not talking about not pursuing your hopes and your dreams. I'm not talking about fully serving Jesus and finding delight in this life. But I'm saying that a lot, of, for some of you, you've already discovered that you're looking for your happily ever after and you're becoming discouraged and you're becoming disheartened and you're wondering if God still loves you because he's not behaving the way you think he's supposed to behave. But part of the problem is that we're believing a storyline that's not the biblical storyline. God's commitment is to be with you no matter what you face. One of the reasons I loved the time singing and listening to the choir this morning was just, just because I stood here or sat here just feeling the presence of God. God is with us. God is with you. If you're 18 or 19 or 20 or 21 and you're hoping and praying for Prince Charming or for your Cinderella or your princess and God cares and God's there, but the story is not always playing out the way you want it to. You know that already. Most of you do. Those of you that don't, you're going to learn that along the way. But God is with us. And here's my invitation to you. In the meantime, in those times when the happily ever after isn't happening yet, and that those times where you wonder, is God there? Is God here? Is God with me? Hold on to him. And let me give you a pastoral exhortation. Hold on to God. Here's my pastoral exhortation. And don't do stupid things. Just don't do stupid things out of desperation. Don't grab onto someone because you're lonely when they're not the right person. Don't make big decisions when God is saying, be patient and wait. Follow Jesus and trust that he's holding on to you. I'm gonna give you one more new phrase. Uh, you know the, ha the happily ever after. I'm giving you happily ever after after. And when you start hearing and feeling the happily ever, where's my happily ever after? Where's it gonna all work? Just say, it's happily ever after after. It may be later in this life, it may be beyond, but I can trust in God that he's got the future in his hands. Here's my other new thing. I'm gonna add something to an existing thing that's in culture. There's another saying, YOLO. Anybody ever heard that? YOLO, which simply means, what? You only live once. You only live once. YOLO. I think translated what it means for a lot of people is, you only live once, so do whatever you want now. It's kind of the idea. You only live once, so drink it in, 
Smoke it in, suck it in, enjoy it. You only live once, just take it. Everything in that you can take in, no matter what the consequences, because you only live once. And a, lot, and, and a lot of, now nobody here at Westmont would think that way. Uh, nobody here at Westmont would make bad choices because they only live once. But, but other schools, you know, the other schools that, that you're thinking about going to. No, don't, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I, I don't work for Westmont. Um, but, but, but there's, you know, it, of, course, of course we can think that way here. So I'm giving you one new saying. And that new, new saying is, is YOLOBS. YOLOBS, okay? Um, there's three ways to pronounce it. I made this up, okay? There's three ways to pronounce it. YOLOBS, YOLOBS, or the one I prefer, YOLO BS. <laughs> Okay? And what I mean by that, to translate, is you only live once, baloney sandwich. <laughs> right? Um, you only live once, BS. It's not true. If you know Jesus, you don't only live once. There's more than this. And so here's my final word of challenge to you. As you walk through this life, and you're saying, where's my happily ever after? Hey, I only live once. I'm going to do whatever I want just to, to stop. And say, wait a minute. Am I believing the narrative of culture? Or am I believing the narrative from the heart of God? And, and I, I hope and I pray that, that you will just be captured by this understanding. That you'll think of Hannah in her sorrow, in her struggle, in her heartache. And yet ultimately her little boy, Samuel, became one of the key leaders in the history of God's people. She, hang, she just hung in there faithfully and sought the face of God. She didn't say, you only live once, I'm gonna go do something else. She just, just stayed the course and sought the face of God. Think about the Apostle Paul. The third time and the fourth time and the fifth time they strapped him up. I don't know after he wrote Corinthians if it happened again to him, I don't know. But I know he pursued God even though it wasn't the happily ever after narrative that he might have wanted. And I know that God can work in and through you in glorious ways. Every one of you are gonna have moments where you look at your life and you look at your situation and you're saying, this isn't working out. Where's my happily ever after? And just say in your own heart, God, you promise not a happily ever after right now always, but you do promise a happily ever after after. A lot of that delight's gonna come in this life. You can't see it right now. It may be just around the corner, maybe down the block. It may be a long way off. But God has something for you now, and oh, God has something for you forever. And you don't only live once if you know Jesus. So live with a bigger picture in mind. Let me pray for you. Let me, God, thank you for, for these young people. Thank you for their hearts, their passions, their dreams. I, I pray that many of those will come true, but I know that many of them will take longer than they think. The road will be bumpier than they anticipate, but God, I believe you will lead them, you will guide them, and you will love them along the way. Help them hold to you in the hard times. And Lord, right now, some of these young people have experienced way harder times than they should have at this point in their lives and way more heartache than they should have. And yet they're in the midst of it all. Let them hold to you. And I pray that as, as those, in those moments where there's that an invitation to take the you only live once attitude and just go for whatever because this is all there is, they will remember that that is not true, that you have more. And then, Lord, I wanna pray right now for all the students and families that are here today uh, discerning and praying, many who have said this is the school, some that maybe are trying to sort it out, will you lead and guide them exactly where you want them to be, that each one may live their life fully for you. Lord, send us from here in your peace. Send us from here in your grace. Send us from here in your power, knowing that, that Lord, there's so much more. Help us not believe the narrative that culture sells us, but immerse us in your truth, we pray in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. God bless you.